of course, uh, Stephen also was double jobbing this morning, isn't he? It's because the worship leader came down with a positive COVID test. Thank you, Stephen. It's wonderful that we have gift in the church. And please don't sit there with your own gift and keep it to yourself. If you have a gift, we want it. Amen. You'll be blessed in giving it and we'll be very blessed in receiving it. Amen. Anyway, it's good to see you guys. We're going to read from Isaiah chapter 44, continuing in our study through this prophecy. <clears throat> My reading is going to be a little bit different this morning in that I'm going to read three verses and then skip a whole bunch of verses and then pick it up again towards the end. And then I'll come back to the bit we skipped later on. Could I ask you please to stand with me as we read from the word of God, because it is the word of God. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared, you are my witnesses? Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. Drop your eye down to verse 21. Remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. <clears throat> Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains. O forest and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. Amen. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your, word, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, but they are more than can be told. Amen. Please have a seat. Well, how appropriate is it that as we systematically work our way through the word of God, we stumble upon verses that refer to the mother's womb on Mothering Sunday? I've got quite a shine off my screen. I need to lift it up. A little bit. So that I don't blind myself. There we go. Yeah, isn't it in the providence of God that we come to these verses where God speaks to his people and says, I formed you, you are my servant. Our third grandchild is due, God willing, tomorrow week. That got me to thinking again about the miracle of new life and procreation. The miracle of conception and gestation and childbirth. Within the first month of your existence, whilst you were still hidden in the depths of your mother's womb, you were smaller than a grain of rice and your heart was beating 65 times per minute. Within one month. Your unformed substance had this tiny little tube, which became your heart. In the second month, your central nervous system was forming. All the nervous connections carefully knitted together. The eyes were taking shape, the facial, facial features appearing, your ears, two little flaps of skin by the side of your head, tiny buds for your arms and your legs and your fingers and toes. Your digestive tract began to form and the framework of your bone was laid down. Two months. By the third month, your arms and hands and fingers and your feet and toes were fully formed. 
you could open and close your fist. You could open and close your mouth. Your fingernails and your toenails began to develop. And the beginnings of teeth were forming under your gums. By 12 weeks in the womb, you were fully formed. All of the inward parts were present, all of the organs, the circulation, the urinary system, the liver, the bile. In the fourth month, you opened your eyes. You had eyelashes, eyebrows. You could suck your thumb. You yawned, you stretched, you pulled faces. Even your reproductive organs were fully formed. That's why they can tell at that stage on the scan. Is it a boy or a girl? In the fifth month, there is a wonderful moment of quickening when your mother first felt life within her. It felt like a flutter, I'm told. The baby moving around, developing muscles and exercising them, hair beginning to grow on the head. The skin is covered with a cheesy substance to protect the skin from 24 seven immersion in amniotic fluid. Some people never lost their cheesiness. In the sixth month, your fingerprints intricately woven. You were responding to sound and you got the odd hiccup. In the seventh month, you were laying down reserves of body fat. You became more responsive to sound and pain and light. In the eighth month, you had coordinated reflexes. You could blink, you could turn your head, you could grasp firmly, you could respond to touch. Your lungs were close to being fully developed at that point, but they were full of fluid, not air. And very little blood was being pumped into the lungs at this stage, and there were shunts in place. So that when your heart beat, a whole gush of blood didn't go into lungs that were empty of air, and the shunt would just recirculate the blood around the body. And then comes the moment of labor, the struggle of childbirth. And the child comes out into the open air. And there's a few tense seconds. And then there's <sighs> the first breath. And all of that fluid in the lungs is very quickly absorbed. And the shunts change around. And now blood is pumped into the lungs. And they're filled with blood. And they're filled with air. And the child oxygenates themselves from the first breath within seconds of childbirth. For nine months, the babe in the womb was nourished and warmed and hydrated and oxygenated. Within seconds now, it has to breathe its own oxygen, generate its own heat, absorb its own nutrition, filter its own waste. Unfortunately, it couldn't change its own nappy. It had to adapt to a whole new world secured by its mother's close attention, who, by the way, just happened to have lactating breasts, full of nutrition for the infant. And the infant latches on and suckles, no training, no classes, just does it. At this point in time, your mother was very delighted that your, your teeth were still under your gums. The miracle of procreation. How well did the psalmist exclaim, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. That's the right response of all men and women to acknowledge with awe and wonder the God who created them. We honor him. Do you know where you came from? You are his handiwork. He put you together in your mother's womb. He knit you together. And then he brought you forth into life. Consider his creative power. And more than that, consider his creative love for he not only made us, but he made us in his image. That we might be known by him and loved by him. 
that we might know him and love him. For you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And when I hear that, I, I say, Lord, then I pray, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The right response of every man and woman before God is to lay the heart bare before him and to cast yourself entirely on his grace and mercy, on his love, worship him in all our lives in thanksgiving and joy and love, a living sacrifice. Amen. Why is it then, why is it then that we are so prone to idolatry? See, that newborn child will grow and learn, it will hear sound and replicate them, it will come to understand and use language, words have meaning. They will observe their parents and their siblings and they will see their peers and society at large and as their personality develops, they will hear ideas discussed and they will see attitudes lived out. They will respond to those ideas and attitudes and ultimately form a worldview of their own. And as they look out and around at all of creation, they can see the evidence of God. They can see his eternal power and divine nature. They cannot see him, of course, because God is not visible, but the invisible things of God. That which can be known about God is plain to see because God has shown it to us in all the things that he has made. The tragedy then is that as the child becomes an adult and even long before that, in ungodliness and unrighteousness, suppresses the truth and repeats Adam's sin, wanting to place himself above God, to decide for himself what is right and wrong, to be master of his own destiny, to fulfill his own desires. And so Paul in Romans says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. And that is why we are so prone to idolatry. So just how futile is the thinking of those who do not honor God? And just how foolish are those who do not give him thanks? It's the folly of idolatry. And now I'm going to come back to those verses that I skipped over, and I'm going to read them from the New Living Translation because it gives a good flow to the thoughts expressed. How foolish are those who manufacture idols to be their gods? These highly valued objects are really worthless. They themselves are witnesses that this is so, for their idols neither see nor know. No wonder those who worship them are put to shame. Who but a fool would make his own God? An idol that cannot help him one bit. All who worship idols will stand before the Lord in shame, along with all these craftsmen, mere humans, who claim that they can make a God. Together they will stand in terror and shame. The blacksmith stands at his forge to make a sharp tool, pounding and shaping it with all his might. His, works makes, his work makes him hungry and thirsty, weak and faint. Then the woodcarver measures and marks out a block of wood, takes the tool, carves the figure of a man. Now he has a wonderful idol that, he ca that cannot even move from where it is placed. He cuts down cedars. He selects the cypress and the oak. He plants the cedar in the forest to be nourished by the rain. And after his care, he uses part of the wood to make a fire to warm himself and bake his bread. Then, yeah, it's true, he takes the rest of it and makes for himself a god to worship. He makes an idol and bows down and praises it. He burns part of the tree to roast his meat and keep himself warm. Then he takes what's left and makes his god, a carved idol. He falls down in front of it, worshipping and praying to it. Rescue me, he says. You are my God. Such stupidity and ignorance. Their eyes are closed. They cannot see. Their minds are shut and they cannot think. The person who made the idol never stops to reflect. It's just a block of wood. 
I burned half of it for heat and used it to bake my bread and roast my meat. How can the rest of it be a god? Should I bow down to worship a chunk of wood? The poor deluded fool feeds on ashes. He is trusting something that cannot give him any help at all. Yet he cannot bring himself to ask, is this thing, this idol that I'm holding in my hand, a lie? As Paul put it again in Romans, he said, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling man and birds and animals and creeping things. There is only one creator. How then can I, who have been created, take something up in my hands and create a God and bow down to it and worship it as if it had created me or had any power over me? As the commentator says, when the creature, when the creature fails to acknowledge and worship the creator, he exchanges the truth for a lie and attempts to fill the void by worshiping something created. Are we really so foolish? Now you might think that you're not foolish at all because you don't carve an idol out of wood and bow down to a statue and worship it. And yet every time we deny the Lord his rightful place in our hearts, we engage in foolish idolatry. This is exactly what we do. We engage in foolish idolatry. So it's not just about making a little statue and putting it in a little shrine and bowing down to it. Although some have done that. I know from speaking with some of you in your culture, this has been part of, of religious life in the culture. <clears throat> and you've turned from that, praise God. But idolatry is much broader than that. This is how Paul put it to the Ephesians and again to the Colossians. He said, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry. That's a bit shocking, isn't it? The Greek word is pleonexia. It means ruthless self-assertion. So that, that hit me hard. Ruthless self-assertion. It's greed. It's uh, I want and I want it now and I want it for me. It is in essence the worship of self, which is the ultimate idolatry. There is a self-focus, trying to make all things re revolve around what I want. There is self-seeking looking for satisfaction in things below rather than in God above. Uh, it places at the center of our attention and devotion anything other than God. And that's what covetousness is. It is worship of the creature instead of the creator. And as one commentator put it, it's the highest treason against the king of kings. That's scary. If greed and covetousness is the highest treason. If you think about it, it is because it says, I am my own God. And that's idolatry. It's what Adam did in the garden, and it's what we've all done. And so, how thankful are we that we are reminded in verse 22. Yet again, by the Lord, I have blotted out your transgression like a cloud and your sins like a mist. Hallelujah. Driving up to Dublin on the early morning, you see all the fields covered in mist. Say, so, well, that's how sin blankets my life. But the sun rises and the mist just burns away. And that's what the Lord says he's done in our lives. He has taken away our sin, even as he removes the mist and clears the air. Hallelujah. Clears the air so that we can have full, unhindered sight of heaven. Hallelujah. So the point of Isaiah chapter 44 is that the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, is the only God. 
There is no other God, no other rock apart from the Lord God of Israel. He reminds his people, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you of old and declared it? Israel needed to hear this. They needed to hear it in relation to their history, to what, for everything that they'd been through and everything that the Lord had said would happen. The Lord said it would happen. Then the Lord made it happen. They needed to hear that again concerning their whole history. They needed, to, they needed to hear it again in relation to their impending captivity in Babylon, because this was the prophecy. You're going into captivity. And as we've seen earlier, they were going into captivity because of their sin. And they needed to hear again that God said it would happen, that God would make it happen, but that God also promised that he would bring them home from captivity, that he would bring them out of exile and back to Jerusalem. We need to hear this as well, my friends. We need to hear this in relation to our journey through life. What do we need to hear? We need to hear Jesus say, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Do not be afraid. Fear not. I am with you. I have said it would happen. I will make it happen. And you will rejoice when it happens. Hallelujah. We need to hear that in relation to our journey through life and all the calamities we face between plague and war and economic upheaval, let alone the personal trials that we each go through. And we need to hear it in relation to his promise. He said, I will come again. Jesus will return. I will come again. And he will bring his kingdom in, in its fullness. And we will have our part in it by his grace. Amen. That promise can sustain us through thick and thin. And so he says in verse 21, remember these things. Remember this. Don't forget it. Remember it. I made you in your mother's womb. You are my servant. We are the sheep of his pasture and he cares for his church. He has made all things and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. Wow. And as creator, he is sovereign over his own creation. He is in control of all things. Jesus is in control of COVID-19. Jesus is in control in the Ukraine. Jesus is in control in a collapsing world economy. Jesus is in control with earthquake and volcano and tsunami. Jesus is in control. He told us there would be these things. And he promised that he would come again. Amen. He promised that he would be with us through the whole lot and that he would come again. No wonder then. That amongst his first words to John in the Revelation, you could say, well, I'll, I think of it this way as foundational words. He said to John, fear not, I am the first and I am the last. And the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now, if you were sitting in a church, say in Ephesus, and you had an understanding of the Hebrew scriptures, and you heard the Apostle John saying, this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the first and I am the last. Don't be afraid. Your mind would immediately go to Isaiah chapter 44. And you'd see it in the whole context of God working out his plan. That he is the first and the last. That everything that he has said, he will bring to pass. And no matter what we go through, we can trust in him to bring it to pass. For he is Lord of all. When Jesus says, I'm the first and the last, he is saying, I am the Lord God of Israel. He is reigning on high, sovereign, indisputably king of kings and Lord of lords. That is our confidence, my friends. That is our confidence. And then, of course, he went on and gave the whole story of the revelation, which reiterates exactly the same thing. Jesus is in control, wars, earthquakes, famines plagues, upheaval, the enemy at work, the Lord harvesting his church, 
bringing in men and women and children from every tribe and nation and language and people. Hallelujah. He who conquered death will bring his word and his promise to pass. Return to him then. He says, return to me, for I have redeemed you. And you know that return is just repent. It's about repentance. That's what it is. If you've been straying away from the Lord, straying away from his church, don't do that. Return to the Lord, for he has redeemed you. He's paid the price. He's taken away your transgression. He has wiped out all of your idolatry. Thank you, Lord. I love that prayer in, in one of the Psalms. It says, Lord, unite my heart to fear thy name. You know that one? Unite my heart. So that it's not that 95% of my heart worships Jesus and 5% I keep for myself. But I confess I find, I find me, myself keeping a, a, a percentage. I don't want to do that. I say, Lord, unite my heart. Get 100% of my heart in. Unite my heart to fear thy name. So that there be no idolatry in me. No greed, no covetousness, no putting myself at the center of things. At the very end of this chapter, he's going to mention Cyrus. Whoa, that came out of nowhere. Cyrus, out of nowhere. He's going to mention that. I deliberately didn't read it. That'll be next, next time up. But the point is that Jesus, uh, Jesus is saying, look, I am in control of all of history, and I can even raise up kings. He does raise up kings. He even raises up pagan kings, and he makes them do his work. He is in control. That's what Cyrus will be all about. But in the meantime, in verse 23, uh, the prophecy bursts out into song. It says, sing, O heavens. And I said, what, what will we sing? The Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. What will be shout? Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. What will we sing? This is what we sing. The Lord has redeemed Jacob. That's our song. The Lord has redeemed us. And he will be glorified in Israel. The Lord will be glorified in his church. Amen. The scripture says so. His word promises it. He will be glorified in his church. And that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? We can rejoice with all of creation, for the Lord will be glorified. Glorify your name, O Lord. Glorify your name. Not unto us, O Lord, but unto thy name be the glory. Amen. I hear the Lord say, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Remember that one? He spoke to Jesus. Glorify your name, Lord. So let's pray, my friends. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are at work in our lives, Lord. I want to lay my own heart bare before you, O God, before you and before my brothers and sisters. I pray, Lord, that you would examine my heart and search me out and that you would indeed, Lord, unite my heart to fear thy name, that there would be no greed, no covetousness, no worship of self, O oh Lord, that hinders your work in the church, Lord, in the world. Oh, we pray that you would uh, fall upon us afresh by your Holy Spirit. Lord, cause our hearts to rejoice and to burst out in song, uh, to, to rejoice, Lord, in the fact that you will fulfill your promise to glorify your name in all the earth. Lord, we praise you and bless you. We give ourselves to you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would change us this morning that as you have already begun a good work in us lord so you continue that work lord i pray work in each heart let there be breakthrough lord for us in these areas lord where we worship you alone with all of our hearts amen amen thank you brothers and sisters please don't run away there's a cup of tea to your left stay around for a little chat and have a wonderful week amen